Hello, thank you so much for joining me. I was invited to give this talk uh, uh, by my friends at Iguanacel um, in Madrid, Spain. Uh, it's for their series on Iguana Talks. Uh, my name is Dr. Joseph Vitolo. Some of you may know me from uh, the world of calligraphy or fountain pens or both. A uh, little bit about myself. The doctor in my name comes from the fact that I am both a general dentist here in the United States, uh, as well as uh, uh, a biochemist. So I have a doctorate in dentistry as well as a master's and PhD in biochemistry. Um, and so I wanna to talk to you a little bit more about some of the stuff I'm passionate about, uh, my, my, my love of fountain pens and what I prefer. Um, and so again, I thank you for joining me with this. Um, I came across Iguana Cell online. Uh, I purchased this beautiful Tasia Miyabi uh, Winter's Breath. This is not the Empress model, it's the, uh, uh, the regular um, uh, Winter's Breath model. Um, but I am a fan of, as some may know, I'm a fan of uh, extra fine Japanese nibs, in particular the Sailor Extra Fines. And it just so happens this is a collaboration between Tasia and Sailor. And this pen actually comes with um, a Sailor made extra fine nib. I absolutely just adore the pen. Uh, I've had a few of these, which is a story for another day. Um, but so that's how I came across Iguana Cell. Had a wonderful experience with them. Um, a very professional transaction. Now I am in the United States. I live in uh, Augusta, Georgia. Um, and they are in Madrid, Spain, which means that when I ship something, if they ship something to me, I have to pay import tax. Uh, but what I love about the site is that they, they, you know, I understand that because some things you can only find in certain stores. And so uh, Iguana Cell basically posts the full price with the cost of the pen as well as the um, uh, duty or the import tax. So you pay everything up front. There's no surprise when you get here. I realize some folks may not want to pay that kind of uh, tax, but the reality is, you know, I could not find this pen again anywhere because there's only like, I think it's like 88 of them made. I could be wrong on the number, but it's been out for a while and I just couldn't locate them. So I located them in Madrid, Spain and then decided to purchase the pen. Uh, purchase the pen. Uh, but Iguana Cell also sells cigarette lighters, uh, wristwatches, uh, and so I would encourage you to give them a, a visit. Um, my love of fountain pens started uh, back when I was a teenager. I was in Manhattan and um, I walked past the store window. I forget the store now, but they had what was the, or is the Mont Blanc 149. <clears throat> And so I instantly fell in love. But as an unemployed teenager, well, I was employed, but not making that much money. Um, I went into the store to find out how I could buy the pen and became very disheartened when I found out the price. Because even back then, it wasn't an inexpensive pen. Uh, and we're talking about sometime in the 70s. Um, and so uh, that memory stayed with me. And many years later, after it was in the middle of my uh, dental school training in Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania, the thought of that Mont Blanc popped into my head. And I just so happened to have some extra money laying around uh, for my school loans. And I uh, asked my buddy, is there a place where I can buy, you know, fountain pens in the area? And so he took me to a store that was down downtown Philadelphia. I think it was Holst's. Um, uh, and so I walked in there and sure enough, in one of the displays, they had the Mont Blanc 149. And so I immediately laid down the money. At the time, I wasn't really into penmanship or writing, so I got the medium uh, nib. I just fell in love with the pen. But the pen, and this was at a time when they were still marking it as made in West Germany. And the pen had a 14 karat gold nib on it. Um, I used that pen for years and absolutely loved it. Uh, many years later, um, after I had done my four years of dental school, you know, almost eight years of private practice, then I went on for my master's and PhD uh, in uh, Bethesda, Maryland, around the Washington, D.C. area, where I was a postdoctoral research fellow at the National Institutes of Health. Um, I had a problem with the pen. The screw that keeps the uh, finial and the, uh, the clip on the pen broke. And I'm not sure why it broke, so I looked inside the pen. It turned out the screw developed some uh, corrosion or rust, and it just 
ballooned out and then cracked the finial. So a store, in, in which I can't remember the name of, a Mont Blanc dealer sends the pen to Mont Blanc for service. You know, a month and a half goes by and haven't heard anything from Mont Blanc. Um, and so I asked the, the, the store to look into it. It turns out Mont Blanc could not find the pen. They misplaced it. And, but they were very quick to send me a brand new uh, made in Germany pen, but with an 18 karat gold nib on it. Beautiful pen. Uh, the pr only problem was, uh, and still is, that was my first love, my first fountain pen. I would trade almost every pen I have for that one pen for, for my possession. Even though it's not a Japanese extra fine, but it was the sentimental value of it cannot be replaced. Uh, and so that's what led me into fountain pens and collecting. I immediately bought a Waterman Le Mans 100 in both the black resin as well as the sterling silver model and a few other pens. Uh, I, I amassed a good collection at the time. I eventually sold the collection way back in about 91, 92. And the reason for it is because you know, for me, the internet was still a rather new thing. Uh, I was on it, but wasn't aware of anybody else that, or, or anybody else that really cared about this stuff. So uh, I sort of lost interest and uh, sold my entire collection. I had things like, I, I bought some of the pens on their release, like the Mont Blanc Hemingway. I paid $424 when it was first released in 1992, and I still have the original receipt. Uh, the Mont Blanc Lorenzo de Medici I purchased and several other, Agatha Christie and the Gold, Gold Vermeil. Um, and so I had a, quite a nice collection, even with some vintage pens, uh, some of the old Watermans uh, in gold uh, filigree work. And, um, but because I was felt like I was alone in this thing and I sort of had other things I had to do, I sold the majority of that collection um, and was actually shocked at the prices some of it would bring. I mean, overall, I don't think I made my money back, but there were a few pens that were just outrageous, the offers I was getting for them. Uh, one was a Lorenzo de Medici, the other was a Hemingway. And uh, I, it was to the point where I was panicked that maybe I described these things wrong and people misunderstood what they were. Uh, but no, I just hadn't kept track of the, of the field in a while. Uh, and so I came back into this probably in, I guess maybe around 2014-ish, um, but you know, something some of you may know about me, I am both a calligrapher as well as a pen collector and a penman. Um, most, you know, my, I made my reputation in the world of calligraphy. I published a free book, which anyone can download, on what's called script in the copper plate style. My particular uh, de uh, area of specialty was the engrosser script. Um, but today, unfortunately, People apply the term copper plate ubiquitously over many different things. And so uh, I will post in the uh, uh, legend section below this video how to download a free copy of my uh, uh, script of the copper plate style book. There were two versions. The first one I made and published in 2012 was actually made for the Mac computer and the iPad running Apple's free program iBooks. It's interactive, it's got embedded videos and, and image galleries. That's the way it was meant to be used. Uh, but for a lot of people that don't have Mac computers or iPads or things like that, I published a stripped down version uh, with a PDF form that anybody could print out. Uh, and, and every chapter or so has the links to my videos on YouTube that shows how I you know, make these letters. Uh, and so it's completely free, no strings attached. I also have uh, I'll provide my guidelines for you free of charge. Um, but, you know, so that was, and that's been downloaded, believe it or not. Uh, I, last time I checked with my site, as well as the Apple, somewhere around well, over 100,000 times. And I kind of regret a little bit not charging maybe a dollar or two for the book. Um, but I wanted what I knew to get out there for people to use. And, uh, because the pointed pen is a very, very confusing thing for a novice to use usually. Um, I also have my own um, uh, namesake oblique pen holder, which is the traditional uh, instrument that people would use for a grocer script. Uh, uh, and so it's made by um, uh, Christopher Yoke, uh, New York Pen Company. And just as a point of fact with that, I'm not pushing anything for sale. I make no profit from the sale of that holder. I let my name and my input be used free of charge. Um, and so I, this, this is not trying to, I, my book, I don't sell my book, it's given away free. 
Um, but uh, now I'll post images of that uh, along the lines of this video, along the, the timeline of this video. Uh, and so that's where I come from. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a dip pen steel flex nib. I, I, you know, copper plate style script as well as engrosser script is shaded script. You must use a flex nib. And they're vintage nibs. They can cost quite a bit of money. You'd be surprised how much these, these old steel dip nibs, uh, dip nibs can cost. Uh, but having said all that, even though I'm a, I come from the world of, of flexible writing, you know, I am not a fan of, of flex fountain pen nibs. Just not. Uh, eventually, even the steel nibs spring. Um, it does. I'm not criticizing anybody that likes to use them for a little bit of variation. Perfectly fine. Uh, but it's just not my cup of tea. I prefer very rigid, almost like nail nibs. Um, uh, I don't like springiness in, in, a, in, a, in a point. Uh, there are pens like the, Pel the Pelican M1000, which is a gorgeous pen, but the nib is very springy. And for me, I feel like I lose control. Some of you may have seen my, my work where I do what looks like, you know, handwriting. Um, but I caution people, what I do is not, I repeat, not handwriting. It's calligraphic penmanship. If you watch me write, and I've got videos on me doing this online, I, I write very slowly. I it's like drawing the, the letters. There are people online who can do the old school uh, penmanship incredibly well. Uh, and, you know, methods like the Palmer method, the Zaner Blozer method, uh, I do not do that. Um, even the, the engrosser script that I did is considered to be the drawing of letters, and some would actually call it engraving on paper. Uh, but that's where I come from. Um, um, I guess I forgot to mention what I do for a living. Uh, besides, I mean, I am a dentist, but my current position um, is the uh, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Advanced Education at the Dental College of Georgia in Augusta, Georgia. And that's where I'm residing right now. Um, so anyway, uh, to move on. Um, you know, I, I, I love, if I had one nib to take with me to a desert island with unlimited amounts of ink, it would be the Sailor uh, 21 Carat EF nib. Um, I just, you know, I, because of the, the grosser script I used to do, I'm used to some certain amount of feedback from the paper and the nib. Uh, I have trouble writing with glassy smooth nibs, buttery smooth nibs. I know people like that, but for me, I feel like I lose control of the pen, whether it's real or not, or perceived, I don't know. Um, and I also prefer gold nibs, like 14 or 18 karat gold nibs, or in the case of Sailor 21K. Now, do I do that because I think they write better? No, I do it because if I'm gonna spend money on a pen, I want the pen to have a gold nib, period. There's nothing wrong with using a steel or a titanium nib. As long as the thing is properly tuned, I can write as long as it's not too springy or flexy, I can write well with it. Uh, but it's a personal choice to want gold. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, I, I think for, for your own use, like Brooke says, there are people out there who love the Mont Blanc mediums or like, write, like writing with mold, uh, a broad nib. Uh, the, the drawback of fine, uh, of extra fine Japanese and sometimes the extra, extra fine, so it's sometimes called UEF, ultra extra fine, is that sometimes you can't really see the color of the ink. Uh, and I, I don't use ink because I want to look at the pretty color. I use it because, you know, it's what I like, it's what I prefer to use. Um, some may know that my ink of preference is uh, Hiroshizuku Yamabuto. I use that pretty much, ex well, I use it exclusively. I haven't used another color ink in a long time. Uh, I don't hate the others, it's just got to do with this. I like to joke around, I'm kind of lazy. Uh, I wanna make sure if I have to, you know, change out the ink in the pen, put new stuff in, I don't have to worry about the ink getting contaminated with the previous color. Uh, and there are people like, oh, you know, I can clean the pen out and very quickly, and I've tried it, it doesn't really work for me. So I prefer just the Yamabuto, it's a beautiful wine color. On a very side note is that, you know, it, it, I am somebody who uh, uh, became a level one sommelier. Um, still got further to go if I want to continue on. Um, but so I have an attachment to the color of wine and the Yamabuto does that for me. Um, so anyway, uh, that's the, the, you know, that's my entire story. You see that now what I pretty much post 
what looks like handwriting. I also use the offhand flourishing for drawing on the same forms I use. My, my paper of choice, I already mentioned Yamabudo is my ink of choice. My paper of choice is the um, Rhodia R Premium paper. Um, and so that's what I, I like using the lined uh, cream colored paper. And the reason why I want to use the, uh, the line is because it harkens back to the school days of using, you know, line pages and stuff. Um, and I also always write with slant angles below my paper so I can see them. I think one of the worst offenses I can think of when it comes to calligraphy and handwriting uh, is not having your letters all on the same angle. Uh, you know, one this way, one this way, and... Uh, uh, just find an angle and stick to it. I know people talk about, oh, I was told that you have to be 52 degrees for Spencerian. And yeah, for traditional Spencerian, maybe you do, but there are people that write off that angle. The great Louis Madaraz, the American penman from many years ago, died around 1910, I think it was, or 1911, I forget now. Um, but one of the greatest to be ornamental penmen that's ever lived. In fact, many people consider him to be the finest that ever lived. Uh, he used a form of engrosser script that had much more increased slant angle you know, that, that broke all the rules. But it's not about rules, it's about consistency. Um, and for those of you that may want to look into some of that, I have a website called zanarian.com, Z-A-N-E-R-I-A-N.com. That is uh, named after the Zanarian College of Penmanship that used to be in Columbus, Ohio. That was a school started by the great Charles Paxton Zayner and his then partner, Elmer Ward Blozer. These are two of the finest penmen to ever live as far as all around penmanship. Um, they would point to Madaraz as well as being the, probably the finest, but these guys were very at or close to his level, but they could do a bunch of other things as well. Engrossing, what we call illumination, uh, text lettering, all that stuff. Uh, and so it's particularly Zayner. Zayner was, was one of the best all-around penmen that ever lived. Uh, and so, you know, Zanarian.com is a historical site that teaches you a little bit about the history of who did it, uh, about the penmen that did it. Um, and so I, I think, you know, from my perspective, you know, there's a lot online now. When I first got into calligraphy and penmanship, you know, way back, uh, there was almost nothing available. And so I made it my... I don't say life's work, that's too dramatic, but I spent many years promoting this and, 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 and uncovering history of it. Uh, and so uh, I do that partially because of my friendship with someone named Michael Sully, you probably know. Uh, Michael's a dear friend of mine, um, but he's a historian as well. I am a historian for Iampeth, uh, which is the International Association of Master Penmen and Grocers and Teachers of Handwriting. A very intimidating title for any for any novice looking to join, but I can tell you that they are very welcoming. When I went there in the first meeting back in 1999, um, I got a chance to sit with someone like uh, John DeCollip, is probably the best modern, uh, you know, day penman alive. Although there's others now like Jake Wyburn, uh, Michael Ward, uh, and so I walk into the place and I see him writing from across the room. At the time, I didn't even know how to ink my pen holder up. Uh, and he was kind enough to sit down and give me some instruction. It would have been sort of like me going to the Masters Golf Tournament, which was, which was recently held here in Augusta, uh, and being able to sit down with someone like Tiger Woods and get lessons from him, which is, you know, without having to offer money or anything like that. And so I always remember, the, and Bill Lilly, one of my mentors, uh, was also very instrumental in my development. He was also willing to sit down and talk with me. Uh, and uh, without any fee. Now, I don't have no problem if somebody wants to charge a fee. People have to make a living. But I've always remembered that incredible kindness that I was shown back then. And so that's why I promote everything and, and, and publish the stuff online. Even when it comes to my calligraphic penmanship, I, I show people how I do it. I've got videos online of how I do it. Because uh, I don't want there to be any secrets or people thinking it's magic. Um, my handwriting is, is pretty horrible. Uh, and that's why I, want, I like to make distinguish, this, uh, distinction that what I'm doing is calligraphic penmanship. Uh, let's see, what else? Is there anything else I need to cover for this video? Um, not really, but I, I do appreciate your attention. And uh, take a look down below at the notes and you'll see all the links, the necessary links, including a link to uh, um, uh, Iguanacell as well, their, their website. Uh, and I uh, wish you well. 
Thank you again for your attention. Bye-bye.